So when we are talking graph-based data management, of course, there is uh, one technology that we should not forget in this lineup, and this is a property graph, a very popular uh, graph database model these days. So today in this video, I'm going to start with a introduction to property graph. <clears throat> Now, um, this introduction will be given from the perspective of what we have learned so far in the previous videos. So um, this is not a first hands-on tutorial for Property Graph, who's those who want to learn only this, um, but it is um, a more uh, detailed discussion of the model in comparison to other models and to uh, some of the design choices that we have seen already with RDF and with Sparkle. Because uh, from this perspective, of course, <clears throat> we are able to uh, discuss uh, in a bit more detail and look uh, maybe more carefully at some of the design decisions that went into one model and the other, um, which we would maybe not notice if we would only look at one of them. So there's value in this, even if you're only interested in RDF, uh, it's interesting to see how another model could work and uh, what the differences uh, are in this respect. Okay, so let's get started. So my name is Markus Kutsch. Welcome back to the Knowledge Graph video series here from TU Dresden or, well, rather from my home in Corona times, but nonetheless. So what is a property graph? Um, technically or mostly structurally, somewhat semi-mathematically, I could characterize it as follows. A, a property graph is, surprise, surprise, a type of graph, which um, has a number of features. First feature, it is directed. So edges have a source and a target, same as an RDF. Um, makes a lot of sense in practice. You, When you want to model something, you mostly want to have direction. <clears throat> it is vertex labeled. It has when we talk about vertex labeled graphs in mathematics, we have a very abstract notion of label. So the, the idea of what a label of a vertex is in property graph is a bit different. I will come to that. It is also edge labeled, so edges can also have labels, again, for some notion of label. It is a multigraph, and this time in a strong sense of the word. Um, so several versions of the exact same edge may exist in a single property graph. Um, Unlike RDF, where we could still have several edges between the same source and target, but only if they had different labels. Now, in this case, Property Graph really has um, complete multi-graph features in a sense that you can have the exact same edge many, many times. Whether this is good or bad, of course, uh, I, I leave that to you, but it's, it's definitely part of the model. <clears throat> it does support self-loops, so it's possible to have the same source and target, I would say. No surprise there, it would be strange to exclude that. And um, <clears throat> it can have, and this is a big difference to many other graph models that uh, are there, it can have sets of attribute value pairs associated to every edge or vertex. And I will show you in a second what these sets of attribute value pairs look like. But um, this is in some sense the defining feature of property graph more than any of the others. Okay, so here is an example from Wikidata. I'm covering something, but it's not important. So let me uh, stay in this corner. Um, <clears throat> this is a screenshot um, from Wikidata a a page on Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and as we have learned there, we have uh, properties in a sense that uh, of RDF. I should be careful with that word when I talk about property graphs, but in uh, Wikidata, we have uh, things like Tim Berners-Lee that are described. And um, <clears throat> the Tim Berners-Lee in this case has an edge called employer or labeled by employer to CERN. And uh, this relationship of Tim Berners-Lee with CERN has further additional uh, annotations, further extra pieces of information that are somehow attached to it, like the start time and the end time of this employment. And these extra pieces of information, they don't belong to Tim Berners-Lee. It's not his start time. He was not born in this year. Um, and it's also not, they are not properties of CERN. They are not even properties of the employer 
relationships that exist between people and uh, their organizations. Um, but this is really, these are really properties of this particular connection between Tim Berners-Lee and CERN. And <clears throat> in property graph, we can mirror these kinds of annotations directly uh, using these attribute value pairs that I was mentioning. Now, drawing this as a graph is not as easy and intuitive as um, it is for plain graphs where we just have arrows maybe with some labels. Um, so what I'm going for here are these yellow boxes, which uh, gives the attributes and values. So here in this case, I have <clears throat> two nodes, ID1 and ID3, I call them. And uh, the first ID has name Tim Berners-Lee and description British computer scientists, so kind of mirroring what we see here in the terms section of this wiki data page. And the second uh, vertex with ID3 has CERN, uh, as its name and the description international organization and connecting these is an edge which also has an id id2 in this case a label employer so this is also possible in property graph and additional attribute value pairs for start time end time and position just like what we have here it would seem not quite like what we have here as it turns out if we look into the details a bit further but uh, at the first glance it is quite similar and it helps us to understand maybe already why this is a useful thing to have because in wikidata uh, this model is not adapted because people like it so much or even less because of any technical reason there was no support for this model when wikidata was created when we came up with this as a data model we did not uh, have a particular target system in mind that would have nice support for this in any way. We didn't even know very much, or I have to admit, I didn't know at all about property graph, even though it had been around at the time. Um, so this was really born out of necessity um, by just looking at what the data in Wikipedia, for example, looks like and what could be a minimal uh, structural approach to capture a lot of it. Uh finding kind of a sweet spot between all the things that you could want to say and uh, the things that you can say easily without having to do a PhD in computer science first. <clears throat> so um, this is very strongly practically motivated and makes a lot of sense. And uh, so we see that property graph in this sense uh, also has uh, this feature. Okay. Nice. So this is property graph. But of course, if I just give you a little doodle as I just did and say this is property graph. Now, after having heard uh, so much about knowledge graphs and about RDF and Sparkle and the details about the semantic nuances in the different uh, functionalities you have there, many question marks will immediately appear in your face, right? Because you know that there's so much more that is to say about a data model than just drawing up a graph picture and saying, hey, this is it, just take it, it's nice. Um, so let's see what else uh, we would like to clarify here. Um, now I'm in the way. Um, <clears throat> first of all, maybe what are the IDs for vertices and edges? If you are inside a system, it doesn't matter very much, there are IDs, but if you want to exchange information, you might want to know that. Remember, RDF uses IRIs, a whole own technology standard for its identifiers. Do we have something similar here? Um, or what, what is meant here by ID? What exactly are those attributes? In my doodle, I just wrote start date and end date like a little string, but technically really what are they? We know that in Wikidata, they are what is called a Wikidata property, which is eventually identified by an IRI as well. So it has an identifier, which is not just a string and it has different string labels in different languages. How is it in property graph? How are they doing it there with the attributes? <clears throat> Similarly, what are the values and um, what kind of data types can the values have? So I wrote here a date and I had fellow um, fellow was a link to another Wikidata page in the original data. Um, how can we do that here? Is that supported? How are these data types defined? You remember in RDF, we had this big XML schema data type set, which uh, goes back to a, um, a large independent standard for data modeling, the XML standard, which had defined all of these data types already. And uh, already this is a very long document. So how is it in property graph? Where does do the data types come from? <clears throat> um, similarly, what are 
those labels. I said that there are labels at the edges. I just wrote employer here. What are they? Similarly, the vertices, what kind of labels are there? And um, maybe you also ask if we have already arbitrary attribute value pairs, why do we even need the labels? Aren't these attribute value pair sets already like rich structured labels um, that can already play the role of, of the actual labels? And in my doodle, I used this a bit, right? I just had an attribute called name, uh, which was given to the Tim Berners-Lee node. And I, it said the name of this node is Tim Berners-Lee. I did not use any label on that uh, particular vertex. I just uh, defined the English label as an attribute in the attribute value pairs. Okay. Now, as it's already said here, unfortunately, uh, the term property graph as such is not an answer to most of these questions. Um, it's more an idea um, than a specific technology standard today. So it is used in many contexts by many companies most of the time and some developers as well. Um, and uh, there's no centralized authority or control over this. So there's nobody who's owning the term property graph and its meaning changes quite a bit. So some there's several efforts to coordinate this, but uh, as it currently is, there's no authority to tell you what property graph really means. It's more of an, uh, a convention or a set of conventions or assumptions uh, that people have when they hear the name. And um, I'm afraid in many senses, it boils down to saying that it's somewhat similar to the doodle here. Yeah. And as long as you have a database that stores information that can be conceived as being somewhat similar to this doodle, you could probably market it, it as something that supports property graph. Um, maybe that's a bit too simplistic. I, I will say more uh, in the next few minutes. Um, so. What's written here is, is it refers to a broad class of enriched graph structures with these attribute value pairs as enrichments of the structure, um, which can be interpreted in many technical ways in different software systems. And we see that in practice. Um, and uh, these interpretations are often incompatible. So they are uh, based on different assumptions and um, you will not get interoperability between two systems just because they both store property graphs like models in some sense. But this might improve in the future. So let me say a bit about the possible interpretations or some of the main possible interpretations that I see um, from uh, my point of view without claiming that this is a full survey of all the technology that is out there and all the products that people have created with the label. <clears throat> the name property graph, as I said, hints mainly at the attribute value pair. So they should be there. And an attribute value pair is called a property in this model. I'm very sorry about that. I can't change it. Of course, I know that in RDF and in Wikidata, a property is the name of the edge label, so to speak. So it, it defines a type of relationship. Whereas in property graph, a property is a um, attribute value pair. Okay, so that's it. I, I will uh, point out these notational differences, these terminological differences in a later uh, place uh, to have help you not become too confused about it. Um, since both of these uh, uh, technologies are quite established, I'm afraid we have to live with this. Uh, people just use diff the same word for different things. That's how it is if things uh, develop independently. You can't blame either side for this. This is just how it uh, was created. <clears throat> okay, so these properties should somehow be there in the property graph model, um, but there are different ways of interpreting this. And um, the first view that I would like to show you how to interpret this is to consider property graph as an object model. And I mean object here as in object-oriented programming. Let me cite from the documentation of one of the most popular graph databases, Neo4j. Um, if you have ever worked with an object model or an entity relationship diagram, right? Think UML. Um, the labeled property graph model will seem familiar, right? So this is speaking to programmers saying, you know what an object is in Java. You know it has these members, these uh, properties that you can access. And this is how the data works. It's just like having a lot of data objects in a database, 
um, without methods associated, just uh, um, objects with their uh, member fields that you can access. And so the attributes are like the field names in a, an object-oriented programming model and the values and all the values you get. Um, Neo4j, and uh, as, as one of the first databases, or maybe the first database that proposed this model or that pro uh, champions this model, um, is not really an object-oriented database. There are also some of those, but still you can see this, this thought of uh, object-oriented programming uh, strongly embedded in it. So the people who developed this, they came from this a perspective of software developers who needed some kind of data management backend solution in their software products. So they started with the objects and um, they uh, developed some kind of layer to uh, persist data for them to work with data and also to analyze it later on in certain ways. And this is how, how such a database came about. So we see these concepts very strongly embedded. Um, <clears throat> uh, so if you take this view, um, the graphs that you have in this graph database are mostly a kind of data modeling API in a programming language. And often this language is Java. So many of the technologies associated with property graph are also completely tied to Java. Um, up to the point where you, when you look at uh, specifications and try to figure out what kind of data types are supported, the answer seems to be any Java object can be a value, yeah? which of course raises questions of interoperability. If you want to send your data to someone else who doesn't like Java, then how, what does it mean there? Um, so there can be uh, challenges, but um, there are very strong um, and popular products around that are based on Java and uh, implement a property graph API. <clears throat> um, Programmatic data object uh, data access approaches in this setting are preferred over query language services. That's another part of the history of property graph. If you are a programmer, you are not primarily thinking of a programming uh, of a query language and how to write it in a string to send it to a service, but you're already in a program and you want an API to access your data. So you are you you approach the problem very differently, and in the end. Um, uh, the query language may be an afterthought of this. You may have other preferred ways of accessing uh, the data. And indeed, there are other ways of accessing property graph data on this level if you're already in Java. Um, there are many examples that uh, fit to this view. There is uh, an Apache project called Tinkerpop and there's Gremlin associated with it as a kind of query language or access paradigm, maybe more appropriately. <clears throat> In general, um, Tinkerpop is very widely used through the property graph world, even in databases that are not strictly um, object model based in the sense of this slide. But um, the uh, implementation itself of Tinkerpop is extremely object based. It really views um, property graphs as Java objects in the end. But of course, you can create such a view even if you have another view uh, in your backend. Uh, so this is why it's widely used even in other systems. Then, of course, the very popular Neo4j database, uh, in some sense of popular, yeah, widely known, definitely, I would say. I'm not sure about um, practical usage. Uh, there's other strong um, uh, products in this space. Um, but yeah, I'm not a market analyst, so I can't tell you. But definitely people who have heard of graph databases have heard of Neo4j. Uh, the graph uh, query language they use is called Cypher. Uh, Neo Cypher, I guess you get the, the, the reference, uh, cultural reference here. Um, <clears throat> There are also a number of multimodal object databases that have adopted this. Essentially, if you're already building a database whose primary purpose is to store objects, maybe from a programming language, as is very common and popular in many places, then uh, adding graph connectivity to it as a feature on top is not a big step. So many people who have developed object databases also have made them into property graph databases. And I think this is why uh, where some of the large following of this uh, view comes from, because many developers are already working with object um, databases uh, or simple object caches even that you use all the time when you do uh, programming, right? I mean, or at least you use a lot if you have server uh, if, uh, uh, architecture sets that need some kind of persistency layer for, for objects. 
Okay. And uh, so there are some of these multimodal uh, databases are uh, listed here um, that support property graph and also other things yeah, as well. Right, so this is the first view I want to present. Now the second view, the first part of the slide is as uh, it was on the previous slide, but from here on it's different. The second view is to see property graph as an extension of the relational model. That's maybe not so intuitive. It might be surprising, but why would anybody think this is an extension of the relational model? Well, essentially because relational databases can store any kind of data. Of course they can like all proper databases can in some way. And so if you already have a strong relational database, maybe you also want to add some graph-like features and you could have a property graph view on top of this. And this has been done in some places. Uh, I quote here from an SAP HANA graph um, reference document that I found, vertex attributes match to columns of the vertex table. Yes, so an attribute name is a column name in a relational data database. Edge attributes match to columns of the edge table. The maximum number of attributes is bound by the maximum number of columns in the underlying table. So not only the principles of SQL and relational models are applied here, but actually also all of the restrictions that are embedded in the underlying implementation are inherited directly um, by this implementation that they have here. Attribute value pairs as something that you store in a table. Okay where the attribute is the column name and the value is whatever you put into the table at this position. In this view, graph are, most graphs are mostly an indexing and access layer of, on top of a relational database management system. Relational database man management systems, of course, always can store graphs because they are just relational structures in some sense. But the access paradigms that are available there are often very um, limited and even where they are feasible in theory, they don't work well in practice. SQL has some navigation features where you can have recursion, but it doesn't really work. No duplicate elimination, for example, and uh, you need to uh, prevent cycles in your graph in order to not uh, have this run forever. So um, using SQL as a graph database engine is, is a bit uh, misguided, but uh, of course you can think of having a kind of graph database access level on top of a standard database. And again, there's an advantage here if nobody is telling you, oh, you have to use IRIs or you have to use XML schema data types, but rather you can say, okay, I happen to have SQL data types, so let me just continue using this. And let's say an attribute is a column name and so on. And um, already you have an implementation of this model. Of course, of course, it's not interoperable in this case with other implementations, but it's, it's, a, it's one feasible interpretation by, of the specification as far as it exists. <clears throat> Right, so um, values, as I said, can be any values that you could have in this SQL language, even proprietary extensions. If you are in any SQL database, they often have proprietary add-ons as well. Um, <coughs> and uh, the, there's uh, various access paradigms you could have in database code, for example, HANA has this graph script language that you can uh, use to issue scripts into the database, so to speak, to have some uh, process server side. Um, and uh, you could also have query languages. Tiger Graph is an example that has a kind of SQL extension to have a query language there. <clears throat> now, Tiger Graph is not really a fully relational database management system, but if you um, read the documentation, it's very similar to one. It has, in particular, very rigid schema, just like uh, this quote from SAP HANA suggests for HANA Graph, um, where you basically can only add attributes to a no vertex or to an edge if you already have a column for that attribute in a certain table. So you can't just freely add new attributes. You have to change your database schema if you want to do that. And um, of course, this has advantages. You can optimize for a fixed schema, but it also uh, comes at the cost of some of the flexibility that people usually like when they use property graph. So I'm not sure this is a very um, advantageous interpretation of this model. If you really want to bring out the best things of property graph, maybe you don't want to uh, have such a rigid version of it. Okay, <clears throat> third view that there is, of course, um, is to view property graph as an access layer, not on top of relational databases, but on top of 
other graph databases, in particular RDF. Um, again, here's a quote to substantiate this claim. Um, property graph data can be loaded and accessed via the Tinkerpop3 API, but underneath the hood, the data will be stored as RDF, says the BlazeGraph Tinkerpop3 extension uh, documentation. BlazeGraph, you know, is the RDF store used in the Wikidata query service as well. <clears throat> so what this means is that internally property graphs are stored in RDF. Again, like with any database management scheme, this system, of course, as it's possible, arbitrary models can store arbitrary other models. There's no surprise here. Every, every database uh, or every powerful database is capable of, of storing content of databases, no matter whether it's relations or graphs or property graphs or whatever. <clears throat> yeah. So this is possible. Of course, it means that the kind of values you can store are um, data uh, literals that are also supported in RDF, meaning that you have the XML schema data types and whatever proprietary extensions your system offers. And so you basically commit to an RDF style notion of property graph there. Um, there are multiple access paradigms to this. Again, people have actually uh, uh, implemented Gremlin on top of RDF interpretations of uh, property graph. The developers who did that, that I have spoken to, were not happy with the choice of doing that. It's a, it's a lot of work. It's very difficult. So uh, really having a full Gremlin implementation running on top of a database is a, a whole lot of work. And, um, but it has been done. It has been achieved. Of course, there's also Sparkle as an option. And sometimes there have been surface syntaxes to make Sparkle a bit easier for the special case where you want to query a lot of data that is just an encoding of property graphs. And maybe you don't want to write up the full encoding, but make it somewhat simpler for you. <clears throat> Examples of this, uh, this approach include uh, most prominently these days, Amazon Neptune, a very uh, powerful cloud uh, sol storage solution that supports property graph and um, also RDF uh, data models. And that is developed at Amazon Web Services. Um, there's Stardock, uh, another um, uh, uh, commercial uh, RDF database with a lot of different features and a uh, blaze graph, as I mentioned. <clears throat> and uh, they, they all use this uh, type of interpretation. Um, right, so summing up, there are three main approaches that I can see. The one is to view uh, this as an extension of object databases with a graph. Structure. This is quite flexible and schema less. You don't, when you have objects, you don't uh, define upfront which attributes such an object could have. So you are very flexible. Often these object databases can be multimodal. I mean, Neo4j isn't really, but many other databases that have this view have this, and uh, which means that you have maybe further features in the database management systems that come from other directions, which can be very useful. Um, and it uh, basically this view then is adapted by a lot of uh, no SQL databases that um, uh, have graph extensions. What you get as data types and formats can vary very much. Yeah? So I was mentioning Java, but there's also databases that have JavaScript um, data models under the hood and they would use JavaScript data types. <clears throat> Okay, second view, relational databases. These are very rigid. They are not coping very well with arbitrary attributes added at runtime. You usually have to declare upfront what kind of attributes a certain type of vertex can have. Um, but this might give you certain uh, imp advantages in terms of efficiency or scalability that you expect from traditional um, you know, 90s style relational database management systems where you uh, store your company's salary table and uh, management hierarchy and all these boring things that uh, you often find in tutorials on these kind of systems. Um, <clears throat> finally, RDF databases, similar to object databases, these are flexible and schema-less. You can have uh, new attributes as you go along. Um, Internally, they are highly normalized. They don't store the um, data in big chunks like objects, but they really break everything down into triples, which uh, could have some performance um, implications, even though I 
don't see them really in the comparison. It's also hard to compare um, systems because they are so different in the feature sets they have. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, so these are based on RDF and have the RDF data types, but otherwise um, are also a valid interpretation of property graph. Why not? Okay, right. Um, <clears throat> so these are the various kinds of property graph uh, data um, uh, models that we see in practice. I think these are the main ones. They are not the only ones uh, overall. There are some more things that you can see if you look for graph databases. Um, for one thing, there is a whole class of simpler graph models around. So if you look for graph databases and have tables of them, sometimes they f include systems which are neither RDF nor property graph, but have some graph structures which are much weaker, which are much simpler, have not so much structure, not so much data types, not so not, not many labels. Um, <clears throat> mostly these are used for network analysis. If you have large networks, large uh, friend graphs from Facebook or whatever, you might uh, want to use some system which can handle this efficiently. Apache Giraffe, for example, is such a type of graph database, which is really more a, a network database, but also has important use cases, but very different from the knowledge graphs that we are looking into here. <clears throat> there are also some cases where you have other paradigms involved. Allegro graph, for example, is an RDF database with prolog support. Um, this could also have some support for data logs that I mentioned previously. So that's a different direction of integration um, uh, that people have been doing. And then there's all kinds of combinations and specialized components and frameworks that you that pop up in practice. Um, for example, it, it <clears throat> can be that some data is stored in Lucene or Solar, which are document databases that are used also to have some kind of object uh, information, but about text documents mostly, which you use for text search. And um, some systems also have exchangeable database uh, storage backends where you are not really committing to what you are using but have different uh, options um, especially for cloud solutions this can be handy and so on so actually this is what the main development maybe that we have seen in the last two decades in data management is that things have become a lot wilder a lot more flexible a lot more um, dynamic and it's uh, the times when you had one type of standard database management solution and you would apply it to every problem are long over so uh, companies these days are really evaluating for each project what what database what persistency layers do i need for this and what is the best best way of handling this and accordingly there are so many solutions and um, in many cases interchange is not really an a target yeah so if you need an object cache for your online video game to make sure that nobody loses their, their current uh, state of the game when their browser crashes you don't really care about storing this into a standard format from w3c to make it you know exchangeable with other people who you know no one else would even know what to do with it so <clears throat> There's many data management solutions which don't have this flavor of knowledge graph encoding that we are interested in here um, but this is of course still a valid use case there okay now another so this is a rather heterogeneous um field that i am presenting you here another kind of heterogeneity that i should mention is of course data access i was already hinting at this as i was uh, telling you about the different systems in rdf today basically most people or almost everything is spark and this is a very powerful language everybody's using it and it's 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 like sql in uh, relational systems it's the main approach of working there for property graph it's far from uh, that level of uniformity and maybe also because of this um, diversity in the application areas um, it's this is kind of natural so <clears throat> there are a lot of apis that people are using so they don't even have query languages they just program against the uh, database backend tinkerpop is leading there but most systems also have their own api at a certain level um, scripting and processing languages are used so gremlin and graph script these are not really query languages only they are more like um stored procedures in a sense that you really send code into the database to have it executed there and to evaluate that on the data um, and then get back some results so it's a it's a slightly different paradigm from a from a more static declarative um, 
uh, graph query language. Huh? <clears throat> it's more like programming. Um, and uh, then, of course, there are also other processing frameworks that people like to use, especially when they do network analysis tasks as well. They may have things like MapReduce and Spark and all of these uh, cloud computing and distributed computing paradigms that you can also somehow uh, mix and match with graph representations very nicely. <clears throat> okay. Um, besides this, there's also indeed a number of query languages. Neo4j has Cypher, as I said. Oracle has something called PGQL, and TigerGraph has GSQL. Um, and what else there is, um, who knows? I mean, many, many query languages are proposed uh, all the time. What um, one can say at the moment is that there is no standard query language that one could go to. It's really product specific. So if one has committed to a certain product, one goes with the query language they use. <clears throat> so that's the first introduction. Um, and uh, I still want to get a bit more technical, so a bit more concrete and not just tell you oh, everything's possible. It's all property growth. I want to get a bit more concrete in the next video um, by focusing on open cipher as a at least kind of popular and kind of widely known uh, approach um, towards this problem. <clears throat> what you still can learn for now, besides the fact that there's a certain amount of chaos around this uh, standard, uh, or, or I shouldn't say standard around this technology, um, you can definitely uh, see that there are certain fundamentals of property graphs that will be the same in all of these systems. Um, where and in particular this idea that you organize graph data in two layers one layer which makes the connections between the edges and the second subsidiary layer where you have attributes and values associated with the vertices and the edges and this two layer approach is very characteristic of property graph and very different from rdf where you just have everything on the same layer huh? advantages and disadvantages are of course uh, coming with the, such a choice um, as you can probably already see after the experiences you got from these videos. Okay, so that's all for this video. Next time we will be talking about OpenCypher. Open uh, uh, see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.